so I think if social scientists were more aware, especially management theorists were more aware, what you say matters because people will change. And if you tell people they're extrinsically motivated in today's where we do have the opportunity, they'll as behave you mentioned, like that. They will behave, yeah, like, behave that. like that. It's just, and I don't know, that, would, that was a knowledge bomb to me coming out of business school, not fully understanding yeah. that until well after, you know, when I was into my PhD studies. Welcome to Think Bigger, Think Better, where we explore how you can apply insights from visionary leaders and the most provocative philosophers and scientists of our time to make your life and our world a better place. Here's your host, author and speaker, Paul Gibbons. And hey, welcome back to Think Bigger, Think Better. I'm your host, Paul Gibbons, and today I'm super excited to have Dr. Kelly Monahan to talk about behavioral science in business. If you follow me closely, you know this is a passion of mine and a chapter in my upcoming book, Impact, Using Science to Change Behaviors, Hearts, and Minds, which will be available for pre-order on Amazon about the 1st of April 2019 and out shortly after that, as I say in the Middle East, inshallah. But first, a couple of things. A shout out to my newest Patreon supporters, Arjen Overwater and Gail Severini. Thanks. I hate the idea of selling ads, and my Patreon crew helps me fund Think Bigger, Think Better. For as little as two bucks a month, you can make a huge difference and get exclusive content for higher levels, five or ten bucks a month. I send free books from my guests, and you can listen in on a podcast and ask my guests questions. So do consider that. Thank you very much. Looking back on the show, last week we had Parag Khanna. The Future is Asian is his most recent book. He's freshly back from Davos, and he shares reflections on his new book and from Davos. Before that, we covered Plastic Pollution, which, well, let's say it's about freaking time, is in the news. And coming up, we have two chief behavioral officers, so more in behavioral science and business. It's a fascinating, hot, hot, hot topic. And I've even reached out to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, to be a guest on the show to talk about the Green New Deal, uh, join the queue. I think probably uh, if I do get her, it's going to be sometime in November. Anyway, that's what I'm up to. And now, who is Dis Kelly? Dr. Kelly Malahan is with Deloitte Services. She's a subject matter specialist at Deloitte's Center for Integrated Research. Her research focuses on the intersections of behavioral economics and talent issues within organizations. Before she joined Deloitte, Kelly was an HR business partner supporting the CFO of Hartford Funds. She has a PhD in organizational leadership with an emphasis in human resource development. So Kelly, welcome to Think Bigger, Think Better. Paul, it's so nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, well, it's really great to be here. So uh, I'm sitting, I've got this book with me that weighs about, I think it weighs about like 40 pounds, the book you wrote. Congratulations. Thank on the you. <laughs> I appreciate that. It, it, it makes it good to my gym bag, a little extra workout gear. That's, that's right. All you have to do is walk around the track with your book a few times and uh, yeah. you know, that, 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 that's your burn for the day. You know, it's really awesome. Congratulations. And um, tell listeners something a little a little funky about you, a little quirky about some of your background or whatever, you know, some weirdo hobby you have. <laughs> yeah. I had somebody say, I, I, my secret guilty pleasure is the housewives of... Beverly Hills is that a is that a show? I the do Housewives think it's a of, show. Of or Housewives of Orange County, and she's like really an intellectual person. I was, yes. she's like I, I'm addicted to the Housewives of Orange County. Anyway, something like that. Was, yes. uh, <laughs> well, you know what I you know as a millennial I have cut cable, so I, I don't have any of those shows. I do mostly Netflix and Amazon Prime viewing. Something I guess probably a bit obscure or strange is I mean we all do have to blow off steam. I love, I've got a retro original Pac-Man machine at my house. And so every once in a while after a stressful call, I'll just go on and play a couple rounds of 1983 Pac-Man and it feels really good. <laughs> that is the first time I've heard that. Yep. How about that? And you're a millennial. So you were born in like what, a, like 80 something? Yes. 80 something. Well, yeah. Early 80s. <laughs> Early 80s. <laughs> Let's how's that? Early 80s. <laughs> I, I'm close right, to Gen right. X. I'm like millennial. So, you know, I'm very close on the Gen X cusp. Yeah. All right. No, but this is amazing, right? Because you've written this book, which is, here's the thing. This is like feedback for you. It could have been six books, girl. You know that? I mean, it's I, insane. Yes, I know. And you know what? I think that is the one thing if I could have done this different. I just had to get, I mean, and you probably know as an author doing this for a while, I just, I had to get something out first. 
and just get it all out. And this is what I hope to be a roadmap for the next three to four books or long form articles, whatever that looks like over the next five to six years. So tell me this, how long did it take you? That's a horrible question, but how long did that take yeah. you? So it's tough because I think from a research perspective, you know, since I'm a researcher, I've been researching these underlying assumptions around business ever since my PhD. So going back for about 10 years ago, actually then entering into, you know, one of the, one of the world's largest consulting firms and, and trying to understand and working with clients how to actually apply some of what I was researching and just kept hitting into roadblocks. I thought something is wrong. What am I missing here? And so spent really about two to three years doing a deep dive in behavioral sciences, specifically around the concept of management and organizational change, and trying to figure out how could we approach this and how can we teach and train managers. And I'm, I'm all about MBA students, so how do we retrain and equip MBA students to actually be prepared to deal with the reality of organizational life? They're the cannon fodder at Deloitte, right? Yes. Oh, 100%. I mean, we, I don't know right. the exact numbers, but, you know, <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah, much yeah. Uh, MBA, Ivy League school, done. You know, you're in. And you, so you, I you think. Soak, you, soak, you soak them up. Yes, I know. Yeah. Yes. I was PWC. Oh, you PWC. Uh, so oh, yeah. I, same same I, world. I, 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 was, I, I was once cannon fodder, too. Yes, exactly. And I mean, so many, many, many times in the office after midnight. Many, oh, many times. Yes. After yes. It's just, it's uh, Back in the day. an interesting culture. And so anyway, so the writing itself took a full year, but I would say it was a culmination of about, you know, seven, 10 years of actual research. Yeah, no, it's insane. Yeah, I can, I can tell that reading it. I mean, I'm an author, right? So, but I yeah. also know the scope of it. it's amazing. So I, just for listeners, here's some of the chapters. The changing nature of work, macro level considerations for managers, rational economics and the theory of management, exploring management alternatives with a behavioral economics lens. The manager's evolving role, connecting and bridging across networks, coaching with toward the development of expertise, building reciprocity and trust, adapting, building trust during change management. I mean, wow. As I said, like it's six books. So listen, why did you, um, you know, I mean, this is kind of like a what makes you tick kind of question. Like sure. why why did you take on writing? I, I suspect this is the definitive text on behavioral science and management, right? Now, maybe it's not, but maybe it's one of them. Anyway, so why did you take this project on? Like what what, what inspired you about the whole thing? You know what it was is um, as I started to become into adulthood, realizing how important and how that'll much be in, work- That'll be in 10 years. That's 10, that's 10 <laughs> still, years more I still listen to, You know, Paul, listen, <laughs> if you saw me, you say, I've got enough gray right now after writing this book. To- <laughs> right, right, right. I hear you. Yeah. Um, what I started to realize is, is how much of our work lives spill over into everything. So, you know, as much as we try to separate, okay, you know, and I have a happy personal life, but then I have this other professional life and maybe I'm miserable. And it, you know, it's almost <laughs> like this flawed assumption that those two aren't going to somehow be interconnected and interrelated. That's an absurd assumption though, but anyway, but yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, it's just, it's so, so absurd that I can't believe anyone ever made it, but <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it, it's still like just yeah. this underlying assumption that we run by. And I just saw, honestly, I, you know, undergrad college student i had this you know I, business is going to be great and it's going to we're going to walk in and we're going to you know help customers and we're going to help meet needs and i'm going to live this very fulfilling work life and i just realized that that's not at all how probably i mean i don't have an exact percentage but i'm going to say the majority of at least americans are going through their their work lives and um you know, the engagement numbers, I mean, the engagement's not a very robust measure, but it's like whatever. Yeah, I think it's even like, globally, like it's that. under 20%. This this should not be the case. What, and I, I think I'm just driven by the question, why is this the case? What, and it, to me, there was a huge paradox emerging. So today we live in, you know, the quote unquote knowledge-based economy. We go into open floor office spaces. We have beer kegs in our offices. We have air conditioning. We are very comfortable. We have ping pong, ping pong table. No? Ping pong table. <laughs> Heading out to Silicon Valley next week. And they are have it, have it all. One going and visiting a basketball court within uh, one of the meeting rooms. And it's like, we have all of this, these pleasures, you know, that we've built into our corporate environments. And yet so little of that's actually changing and influencing the way people are showing up. And I just, I see us continuing to appeal to these extrinsic motivators that I think are based on some flawed industrial assumptions around people at work. And so I thought, we need to update this. We need to let people know humans, I, I don't necessarily think human needs at work have changed dramatically over the last couple of centuries, but work itself certainly has. And yet it's become more- Well, like the variable. expectations have changed. I would, I would, expectations. I would sort of say the expectations have. See, my granddad, uh, he painted ships, right? He was born in 1900 and he didn't expect fulfillment or- 
to be, you know, up somewhere up the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, whichever way you want to look at it, the man, you know, he, he's there to earn a paycheck. And when I started writing in the 1990s on work and spirituality, that was my 15 minutes of fame or something like that. I told my mom and she said, don't be silly, sort of, you know, the way moms do, right? You know, <laughs> yep. <laughs> is, that a, is that a balloon I see? Boop. <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, and she's like, people just come to work for a paycheck. She said, mm -hmm. I don't know what you're talking about, all this fulfillment and meaning, purpose, connection, community, all that BS, right? Mm -hmm. So that was my mom. <laughs> that was my yeah. mom. Thanks, mom. <laughs> exactly. You're like, okay, great. That my life's work <laughs> down the drain. <laughs> yeah, right. My yeah, I spent two years writing this SOB. But anyway, yeah, exactly. So I've always felt very fulfilled at work. You know, I I mean I, maybe not when I worked at Burger King when I was fifteen, but yeah. um I've I've always enjoyed what I've done. I I so I sort of don't get it in a way I don't get it, but I guess I've always done work that I ended up wanting to do. Or even if I was in a profession that I didn't necessarily choose as my life's purpose or anything like that, once I was inside it, I kind of adapted my framework so that the work had meaning and fulfillment and purpose for me. I've had seven different careers, but I've, I always find myself pretty happy. So I don't get it, but I do know engagement numbers suck. And it's partly to do, I guess for listeners uh, who haven't read my book or yours, uh, or psychologists, what are intrinsic motivators and why, why are they, why are they a poor way of motivating, engaging staff? How about that? Yeah. So, you know, when I think about extrinsic motivators, th th those are anything external that, you know, live outside of you. So whether that's the paycheck itself, the uh, basketball court, the beer keg, all of those are extrinsic motivators to help get you out of bed in the morning and hopefully ultimately perform at higher levels. So carrots and sticks, we sometimes carrots say in the sticks, in the exactly. It's pretty simple. Yeah. It's you know, do do your task. It's very measurable. It's very tangible. You know, it, it's really what most of our performance management systems have been built around. Yeah, uh, yeah, and but also um, carrots and sticks apply to prisoners. Uh, they apply to ch the way we punishment. Corporal punishment is now illegal for children, but we still punish children uh, mm -hmm. you know, with naughty steps. We still say "good boy," "good girl." Uh, we still use rewards, praise. I'll give you twenty bucks if you do your homework. You know, we still use that. So we're still using external motivators everywhere. So it's not in the. It's not just in businesses. It's just sown through the DNA of the way we think about how people are motivated. They avoid pain and they seek pleasure. So what's wrong with that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I, I'd like to think, and, and I think hopefully now the behavioral sciences are having empirical evidence to prove that humans are much different than dogs, which were a lot of our, you know, behavioralism extrinsic motivators no. came from. <laughs> not, not, not my colleagues. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, <yeah. laughs> I'd like to think we're more than just Pavlo's dogs and salivating at the, you know, thought of a biscuit. One of the researchers I study a lot, and I'm actually from Rochester, New York. So U of R, Orion and Dacey and self determination theory. Who's this? Who's this? Say, say it again for the, for the uh, crowd. Last the name, it's Ryan and Dacey. Daniel Pink, and when he wrote Oh, Drive, Desi and Ryan. Desi, Desi and Ryan. Desi, Desi and Ryan, the, the thank you. Yes. Desi and Ryan. Yeah, sorry. I yes. had a so funny cognitive yes. bias there. I couldn't handle it. And they're the dudes with yes. the uh, magic markers, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. okay. Tell the, magic mark, tell the magic marker story. So I'm trying to think. They're also the ones with the candle, and I'm trying to think. Matching. matching All right, tell me the candle story. Tell me the candle story. Candle tell story. Me, okay, let me tell you the candle story. I'm trying to, like, I'm going back to my studies here. I'm like matching markers. So I know with the candle study, what they were able to replicate, I'll tell you two studies real quick. One was around the candles. And so what they did is they, you know, had this box and it basically was filled with all these different, you know, items, a candle, um, paper clip. And what, what the students had to do was assemble this in a way that actually made it so you could light a candle and it would stick to the, to the wood that they had assigned. Creative yeah. task. And so yeah. they told one group, they went with the extrinsic reward, we will pay you, you know, 10 or 15 bucks if you're able to figure this out. The other group was much more of an intrinsic or, you know, actually let me tap into some of those, you know, humane, creative sense and the forming a community and collaboration. And just for the sake of learning, that's how your reward yeah. is going to be. And so yeah, obviously- or fun or whatever. Exactly. Or, yeah. Fun. This is, and so it was the group that was yeah. being extrinsically rewarded was unable to complete the task in time <laughs> because there was inbreeding and fighting and competition started to emerge and- where the other group was much, which was centered around creativity and learning, was able to successfully, you know, complete the task and work well together. The second study they recently conducted, which actually I mentioned a little bit in the book that I love because it has more of a business context, is they followed students. So those that got, you know, economic majors and at the end of when they graduated college said, my purpose is to go make money. Like that is, I'm extrinsically motivated. That That is exactly why I'm going to go do what I do. 
And then they asked the other students, you know, still could have maybe got an economics degree or business degree, but said, you know, you know what, my, my purpose to go use my degree is to go create change or do something better. It was something related to relationships or something beyond a paycheck. Something, pur- something pur- purposey, right? Exactly. Yeah. And they followed, yeah. this is like a longitudinal study, which I love. They followed these students for 10 years. The rates of depression, but it was even like how much they were earning, how many job changes they've had, just the level of stability. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of, lots of, lots yeah, of lots metrics. Of, lots of measures. Yeah. And, and they realized that those students who were intrinsically motivated some of them ended up actually making more money than those that were extrinsically motivated and were much, just in terms of um, some of the positive psychology scale, so human flourishing, some of Seligman's work they use scored so much higher than those that were extrinsically. So I just think, again, they, they've done so many lab studies over the, the past several decades to show that humans intrinsically motivated tend to lead to much better outcomes. Now, have you read Punished by Rewards by Alfie Cohen? I have not. It's a monster of a book. You know, it's written a long time ago right now. But the assumption, Kelly and I are talking for listeners about a theory of human behavior called behaviorism, basically, which is we uh, seek pleasure and avoid pain. And that's the foundation, basically, of economics and psychology, really up until the 1960s or 70s, but it's still sown through our culture now. But anyway, Alfie Cohen, the, the behaviorist will say, well, I understand that you know punishment doesn't really work and it really doesn't change behavior in the long term, yada, yada, yada but rewards do work. And Alfie Cohen wrote, in my opinion, the seminal kind of debunk of that notion that rewards kill cooperation. They create teamwork. They kill intrinsic motivation. They kill creativity. They kill the sense of autonomy that people feel in their jobs. All of the stuff that we value, are, I say kill. All right, that's way over dramatic. But they right. impair the intrinsic motivation, the stuff that we want workers to have, meaning connection, purpose, engagement, creativity, collaboration, yada, yada. So all those things. It's like the scales fell from my eyes when I read that. But um, anyway, so so that's what we are saying. So, And it's funny because nobody takes behaviorism in psychology very seriously, <laughs> not since the 1960s or 70s, right? I'll tell you something funny from my research. Okay. J.B. Watt, J. B. Watson, 1920s, one of the two most famous behaviorists. The other one was B.F. Skinner. J.B. Watson uh, wrote an essay up in the Atlantic or the New York or something like that called The Danger of Too Much Mother Love. And it was basically, <laughs> uh, <laughs> for real, it's like this dude, Jordan Peterson, today. I don't know if you've heard of this guy. He's such yeah, a yeah, yeah. professor. From, oh, totally. From, yeah. I won't even uh, get yeah, started on that. <laughs> don't even start uh, on Jordan Peterson. He's a moron. But anyway, um, Basically, the J.B. Watson said that, you know, you don't spoil kids. You don't, you know, you know, this whole thing. And that was, you know, accepted as, you know, these things. See, the interesting thing about psychology, like when you watch an electron, uh, this is 100% mm-hmm. true if you're a physicist, but if you watch an electron, the electron doesn't change. And if you write a paper on quantum mechanics or you write a right. paper on chemistry or you write a paper on CRISPR, you're not changing the DNA, right? You don't change DNA when you write a paper on DNA. But in psychology, psychologists, the profession of psychology isn't just observing the way that human beings, their minds and behaviors work in a kind of academic way. Yes, we do that. But also the work shapes the culture. Yes. And so behaviorism shaped our culture very powerfully in the early 20th century. And now we have some more positive influences. You mentioned one positive psychology. So I, I think that's a fascinating, you know, social science phenomenon. The social sciences actually change culture. They don't just report on culture. I think that's a fascinating thing, right? As social science as a social science guy. I couldn't agree with you more. And I actually I don't think we the majority of us are as astute to that observation. I mean, I think a lot of times because of where business schools have, you know, they've kind of tried to fall in more of this quote unquote hard science. You know, I think we've all business of, schools. Yeah, I, don't know. It, it, I, I yeah. don't think. Yeah, I don't know. I, think, I don't think that highly of business school. I have to tell you. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I, mean, I, I think of, I think of business school professors as historians. Basically, they yeah, take all but, of the, the clever things that are happening in Silicon Valley and they write histories and interpretations right, and conceptualize them. But I don't but think I, they. I, yeah, I can't believe but, I just said that. I'm never going to work in a business school again. Yeah, but, I was um, say, you might have to edit that. Right <laughs> uh, but I'm you're done, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm nearly sixty. I'm done editing. But yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think you're spot on because I read this article um, in 2005. By Goldstrom, and unfortunately, he passed right after writing this article, but he wrote how bad management theories are destroying good practice. And oh, yeah, he, exactly. Okay, that's yes. the exact thing. So management theories aren't an objective observational study or any kind of scientific study. What management theories, in fact, do is they're prescriptive or 
Yeah. And even maybe self-fulfilling. <laughs> and self-fulfilling. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. So, so someone writes about matrix management and all of a sudden yes. matrix management is a thing or Correct. someone writes about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we get it. Yes, yeah. exactly. And consulting firms, you know, we're oh, part of the problem too. We, we, you know, we run in and we reinforce these necessarily, you know, not always tested assumptions around human behavior at work. And, and then we wonder, you know, why we've got this, you know, engagement problem. Um, so I think if social scientists were more aware, especially management theorists were more aware, what you say matters because people will change. And if you tell people they're extrinsically motivated in today's where we do have the opportunity, they'll as behave you mentioned, like that. They will behave yeah, like, behave that. like that. It's just, and I don't know, that, would, that was a knowledge bomb to me coming out of business school, not fully understanding yeah. that until well after, you know, when I was into my PhD studies. Your, P, your PhD is in business or what's it in? In business, yeah, more on the org behavior side, though. So I, I focused yeah, yeah, yeah. my discipline was in uh, human resource development. So listen, um, this has been maybe for our listeners who are of a practical bent. This has been slightly too abstract, but I hope it's oh, been so, yes. like informative and interesting for them. But I started a podcast recently. Did a podcast recently, and I started with the saying, "The world is going gaga for <laughs> behavioral sciences right now." Literally, yes. gaga, gaga. It's like the new black in management yeah. right now, which yeah. I, I mean, I feel good about because I was, I think, one of the very first people to yes. write about nudges. Uh, I read Thinking Fast and Slow and yep. Nudge. But right when I was writing my, my book on change, you know, uh, I mean, you'll love the story, right? Because I'm sure it'll resonate with you a little bit. So I was going to write, I'd never written a book before, right? So I was like, okay, mm -hmm. 2013, I was living in a small town. I didn't really have any consult. There's no consulting work within as far as I can tell a thousand miles of here. Um, oh, <laughs> so, so I was like, <laughs> That's okay. That's a little bit of a problem. I, 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 and, I, and I'm a New York, I'm a big person. So I'm living in a small town. I'm kind of depressed. I'm like, what the heck am I going to do? I wanted to write for a decade. Anyway, so I go, I'm going to write a book on change. I'm going to write the easy peasy ABCs, change management 101, <laughs> the, stere the stakeholders and the resistance yep. and the yada, yeah, yada. Yeah, I was going to write that book. And then at the same time, I never read business books. I find them really absurdely um, trite and I, under Underwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> Underwhelming. Yeah. So, but I was reading Thinking Fast and Slow, and I was reading Nudge, and I was reading Dan Ariely. I was reading a guy called Nassim Taleb, who's a controversial economist. Anyways, I was reading all this interesting stuff, and I go, yeah, this stuff is really relevant to change. So, all of a sudden, this book that I was going to write literally in six weeks, right, all of a sudden oh, wow. turns into like, I was turned into a two year project. Anyway, no, I'm delighted. The book was really well. Yeah. So, I was early. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I was, I was early in the game, but the book was written in 2014. And now I come back to revising the chapter and I'm writing like, Chief Behavioral Officer? Are you kidding? Like, exactly. That's what? a job. <laughs> Is that a job? And where do I apply? Because I'm right. probably am qualified for a job like that but um so anyway like so so why is the world gaga right now i mean mckinsey and the harvard business review and forward-thinking businesses so there's an amazing book by the way called work rules by Laszlo yes Bach. Laszlo Bach. i have read that yeah, one. yeah that's a, that's a very good book that came out uh shortly shortly after mine i was like ah oh, damn because mine was sort of kind of theoretical and he's full of examples um but anyway okay yeah. so oh, how's why is the world gaga for uh behavioral the behavioral sciences right now like what's up with that it's funny, I was having a conversation actually about this recently with um, John Seely Brown. You know, he's our co-chairman at the Center for the Edge. And, you know, his sense is, and, and we were debating this a bit, is that the workforce is starting to to demand more. And, and he feels like there's there's some power shifting a bit to the actual workforce because mm -hmm. they are disengaged. They are not happy. A lot of times this is, you know, blame on millennials or, I mean, I think it's much more complicated than that. But regardless, there's a shift happening where people want more from their work and um, they're expecting it. And I think what's happening is we've marketers and marketing teams have been using behavioral science for the last couple of de decades. I mean, they've really learned how to dial oh, yeah. in. So this is interesting. So, so let's just, let, let's just say okay. how, right. You know, for, for listeners who are like, yeah, hundred percent, it's been in the marketing world for, I don't know, you say 20 years, maybe 10 years, 20, 15 years, something like that. What's an example? You know, marketers realized, you know, again, I, I don't know the exact time frame, but I would say several decades ago, they weren't selling a product. We weren't just as extrinsically motivated or rational. You know, rational will all probably be driving, I don't know, a Toyota Prius, <laughs> you know, whatever's the most economical, saves us money and lasts yeah. over time. And so instead, yeah. they, they realized we were much more drawn to social desires and norms. You know, we want to keep up with the Joneses. We want us to make us feel good. We want to have features and luxuries. And, and so they weren't selling a car, they were selling an experience. And so, yes. yeah. and appealing yeah. to us at a much more emotional human level. And marketers also realize we're not rational. We, we don't actually make rational calculations. And oftentimes, um, 
are swayed by a variety of biases and, and influences. And so they've, I think, have learned to really have mastered the art of probably selling to us because they have appealed to the in- intrinsic needs. They have leveraged social norms and peer pressure. You know, when I get like the Nest um, readout now, it's constantly being compared to my peers and neighbors on how much energy I'm using. <laughs> yeah, that's right. What's a, what's a good salary? As someone said, someone said, what's a, how do you define a good salary? He says 10% more than your brother-in-law. Right. Um, but- <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. So, th- so they know that. And so I think, and God bless HR. I mean, I am a talent person through and through. We just tend to, you know, we're a little bit behind the ball on these things. And I think we're starting to realize, but You know right. what? I mean, you're so funny. I mean, you work for Deloitte. So, I mean, I'm not going yeah. to dispute anything you say. I agree with you 100%. Like, you work for Deloitte. Like, people make fat stacks, to use uh, Jesse Pinkman's language, at Deloitte, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you know, yeah. people are really well paid. The partners are making, you know, seven figures-ish, some, you know, more than that. Uh, if you're a 40-year-old junior partner, you probably make 250 a year, 300, 400. I don't know. That's my brother's a junior partner. So okay. kind of dope. They make good money, right? So it's like we are talking about people being, you know, your chairman uh, or co-chairman, whoever, the, uh, Mr. Seely Brown. Yeah. Or you're talking about disengagement and workforces being, you know, unhappy and perhaps not aspired or having greater expectations at a firm where people are being you know, like you don't have really any people at Deloitte that are outside the 1%, not very many. I mean, not many that are older, right? right. Certainly not people in their 40s. So so there you go. So so what's up with that? I mean, that's a strange, strange thing. Don't you think? It's a paradox. If you're talking about it. What about people who are making seventeen fifty an hour or, yeah. or something like that? If you're having trouble engaging your workers, you know, what about people who are making twelve fifty an hour? Like, how are we engaging those? And right. I think this is where rational economics has fallen so short in giving us explanations for these types yeah. of paradoxes. Where, exactly. and I do think it, and I do think you bring up a good point because this is a very privileged conversation in many ways that we get to have. Because you're right, it is. Yeah. We have at the bottom Maisel's hierarchy of needs. We're not concerned about that. So now we're going up higher and it's like, okay, I still want more. I want something different. I want a different experience still appeal to me at a more human level. That's yeah. a privilege. And to your point, your, your grandfather that you mentioned before didn't even have that opportunity. And so exactly. and there, exactly. and there is a big part of our workforce who are underpaid and who are not necessarily experiencing that very basic Maslow's hierarchy of needs. They either don't feel safe or are coming into work and aren't getting paid it fair and a livable wage. But that doesn't right. excuse, you have to pay them extrinsically, but they are still humans and we still have to engage them in, intrinsically as well. It's a full package. So anyways, yeah, but I, I think you're oh, actually yeah. right. But I, when I did my thing on spiritual, spirituality work a long time ago, um, there's it's, you won't find this in American business schools, but in, okay. in UK and European business schools, you'll find uh, critical theory, which is you know basically derived from sort of a socialist Marxist sort of worldview. And uh, I was talking to someone who's a professor over there about it. And from her point of view, spirituality at work was a another tool that capitalists could use to to whip the backs of workers. <laughs> wow. So. I, and I'm being hyperbolic. Well, of course, but yeah, I love that. Uh, but, but yeah, but it was another way. But all of these kind of, you know, if you imagine what the what the capitalist managerial class really want is people to show up, uh, work hard, not cause too much trouble, and you, you know, whatever, be good soldiers. And they there's these pretenses like vision or engagement or the ping pong table or all of these kind of things that are supposed to enhance the worker's experience. But all of that is inside a conversation called, how do I make more money? You know, how do I, all, all, all of that, the, the system, if you will, yes. I, I, I don't know if we want to go down this conspiratorial lens, but the system, it's not like the system has a consciousness or something, but the way the system works is we do, you and me, talent people, OD people, culture people, engagement people, whatever, we're doing all this stuff, but basically that's to make people feel good about basically working for the man. I, I, I mean, I just introduced that. I, I don't really, I wouldn't really sign up to anything like that. But when I was writing about spirituality at work, I was really like, oh, and you know, we're going to connect people with meaning, purpose, and community. And, you know, work should be, you know, connected to your spiritual values and your sense of purpose and the transcendent in life. And this guy was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> You're like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah. Well, did you happen to read um, by James Hoops, False Prophets, the gurus who created modern management and why their ideas are bad for business today? Oh, no. That sounds awesome. That sounds I awesome feel like you, you're going to need to read this. He's a history professor out of um, Babson College. He talks a lot about, I mean, it's a very thought provoking book that I read yeah. as I was preparing my manuscript. And it's, 
exactly what actually a lot of what you just described is it's in order for an organization to exist and be efficient and scale and be controllable, it's the very opposite of democracy. I mean, it's like you you can't have the same freedoms that we, you know, espouse in our society. And it's just, it's, it's a, again, another paradox of when you go into corporate corporations, there is this automatic disconnect to the very quote unquote American way. Um, oh, and- I, unbelievable. I can't believe you're saying that. That's exactly something I say. We fight very hard for our lib- liberty and autonomy in society, except when we walk through the yes. door of our workplace and we go up all our democratic rights. The only democratic right you have is the right to leave, basically. Yes. Hire and fire at will. And, you, and also <laughs> not to be, you know, not to have someone grope you, although that doesn't really apply if you work for Fox News or CBS. But, um, <laughs> <It's> true, true. <laughs> <laughs> or to be discriminated against, but that doesn't really. Yeah, anyway, yeah. you know, so you, you abrogate all of what we would call human rights when you walk through the door of a workplace. And certainly, you know, your right to have a say in things that are important to you. So the principle of democracy is people should have a moral stake. Something I have a moral stake in, I have a moral interest in, I should have yep. a say about. And that's the principle. And that we abrogate that when we go to workplaces. So I, I, I agree with your boy. I haven't, I haven't read him, but I totally Okay. Agree. I think you, yes. He, I mean, even if just to like read the, like his introduction was mic dropping and I was like, oh my God, I need to download this book. Like I've never heard anyone else talk about this. And he just does it again. And he's a historian. So he just does it in a very, you know, historical fact based way of here's, here's what happened and here's what we're faced with today. So it's, it's, right, it's right, a great read. Right, 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 right. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds awesome. I will read it after I get through the, <laughs> Why don't you finish writing yours first? And then? <laughs> <laughs> no shit. <laughs> if you'll permit me a 10 second commercial break, Think Bigger, Think Better survives only because of the goodwill and support of its Patreon subscribers. So if you're loving the show, head over to patreon.com Paul Gibbons and hit that become a patron button. For as little as $2 a month, you get extra content, free content, can listen into recordings and get free books. So thank you very much for your support and back to our show. But anyway, so, okay, so we've got behavioral sciences and, okay. and, 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 and everybody's gaga for behavioral science. And I knew we'd have a great conversation, by the way. I knew we'd have a lot of fun. And oh. I also know we digress a little bit. But let's go oh, back to behavioral science okay. and why people are gaga for behavioral sciences. So one example that consumers might know is, is something called defaults and decoys. So if you are shopping online and you see three mm-hmm. options, look closely at the pricing of them because what they'll either have is is a decoy or a, I said, what's the other one? Decoy or a, but uh, anyway, so the decoy basically says the digital only version of this magazine, I'll use a magazine, is $50 right. a year, but digital and print is $58 a year. And so you're like, oh, hey, whoa. What <laughs> you know, deal. That's, a, that's a great deal. <laughs> and they do it at the movies. So if you've been to the movies and you say, can I have a small popcorn, please? And they and you, they say, okay, that'll be four dollars and fifty cents. Absurd, right? Their unit cost is probably a dime, yes. right? Yeah. But anyway, they say well, four dollars and fifty cents, and they say, would you like to make that a large for a quarter more? Now that again is a behavioral thing because everyone's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, you may not eat it; you leave yeah. three quarters of that. But you know, that is basically called decoy pricing. And so they've become very clever at manipulating consumer behaviors, understanding behavioral science. And so, you know, one example is uh, from the Thaler book is the way they organize choices in the cafeteria. I prefer the the grocery store example. So if you want to go and buy vegetables in most yep. grocery store, you have to walk through the aisles of Doritos and, and yep. candy. And, and they have all the stuff that, you know, the salacious magazines. So you're standing yeah. there bored at the checkout. So you're standing there, you're bored like, oh, God, what is this? Well, this person hurry up and get their money out or something like that. And yep. There's a salacious magazine and there's some candy and there's all that kind of impulsy stuff at the thing. So grocery stores are masters at organizing your choices. Now, you have liberty to choose, and that's why the behavioral sciences are so interesting these days. You could buy what you like at the grocery store. No one's telling you what to right. buy. But they're arraying the choices in such a way as they make the most dough. Or coincidentally, you make the least nutritious choices because you right. know all of the – you find all the healthy shits at the back, right? <laughs> or up in the corner yes. or whatever, right? <laughs> so, I mean, uh, so that's behavioral science in action. I think I think listeners will be familiar with that. So, but your genius for your book, I think, is saying, like, how do we apply this to organization development, to talent development, organizational change, yada, yada, yada. So, so now for listeners, they know, okay, that's what behavioral science is. That's why things, people are gaga about it. Okay, I believe you if you say that. Like, how do you apply that? to bigger issues like talent, engagement, trust, some of the things you talk about in your book. Because, you know, it's funny, and I love that example you just gave too, uh, the grocery store, because I think that what that shows, 
we have, you know, we obviously still have autonomy in those things. But I do think behavioral science, if not really thought about the philosophical, you know, underpinnings and assumptions of how we're designing organizations or how we're designing grocery stores, can yeah. really lead to one or two outcomes. To your point, one that, you know, the consumer will will flourish and, and be better, the worker, um, and will actually create a better society, or will continue to fall into this trap and mindset of, you know, on the business side is shareholder wealth maximization, but on the consumer side, which is very similar, you know, whatever, the Dorito packages, you know, will, will be sold more and will have, unfortunately, unhealthy lifestyles. And so when I wrote this book, I wanted to really make sure we were thinking about, okay, human behavior is pretty highly malleable depending on what we're exposed to. Good example was a 401k. So when it was a default, no longer you had to fill out all this paperwork. Employees now were defaulted into a 401k. They had to actually fill out the paperwork to opt out. That ended up being fairly good for you know, longer-term saving plans. Um, Huge. Uh, 30% of people people don't take up the free money because you have to opt in. But when you, when you have to opt out, like they all take it, right? And they they do that for organ donation, for example. I mean, in Austria, 90% of the people donate organs. Why? Because you have to opt out. Whereas in the United States, in most states, you have to opt in. You know, and, and it's an amazing thing. And that's a behavioral tweak. It's called changing the default options. Do you use MindSpace, by the way, in any of your reckoning? Is that oh, something you're... Yes, I do do MindSpace quite a bit. All right. But anyway, carry on your story. I interrupted you yet again. But we'll talk about oh, yeah, MindSpace in a minute. Anyways, so, you know, so when I think about, okay, now we're, t- we're giving, I think we're giving a very powerful tool in the hands of managers and HR professionals and saying, okay, if you do these things, it is likely that employee behavior will change. And I think it's a it's a, and a tremendous opportunity, but I think it's a tremendous responsibility. And I don't if we don't take a step back and figure, okay, to what outcome are we doing these things? Who do we want to benefit when we're talking about changing employee behavior? Is it simply so we can operate faster right. and cheaper and be more productive? Yeah, that to me, we're going to go right back into terrorism days and um, end up dehumanizing a lot of our workforce and workplace. Yeah, and, and your intentions matter. If your intentions are to manipulate or coerce, then you're back in the sort of early 20th century Skinnerian Watsonian world. Intentions matter, yeah, ethically. Yes, intentions matter greatly. And so I think what I'm trying to do in this book is is start to have managers think about, okay, there's some great things where you can build, you know, a lot of times I talk about social capital. You can become more efficient and work better by having healthier relationships in the workplace an outcome of having a healthier relationship is it will lower your transaction cost of doing business. And here's some ways that behavioral science can help us have healthier mm-hmm. relationships more frequently, easier without yeah. necessarily taking those extra steps and opting in. And a yeah. lot of times we just don't think about that in the management space. Yeah, that's that's great. Like a high trust relationship, there's two reasons to have a high trust relationship. One reason would be kind of an intrinsic reason is you know they're more fulfilled, they're more engaged, when they're in relationships where there's high trust and when there's low trust, the relationship sucks. And the other reason for high trust relationships is they're frictionless and you can collaborate and be more effective and efficient as a unit. And so we have to take into account both, right? So, so trust is important in organizations and for both those reasons, for both like intrinsic reasons, if you want humanistic reasons and both for rational economic profitability and efficiency reasons. And so Paul, I think this answers your question. Why is behavioral science is so hot right now? It's because <laughs> I don't necessarily think prior, before we entered, and again, this isn't applied to all businesses, so this isn't, you know, but just for the majority of where our economy is going, where it is based on more digital platforms and knowledge-based transactions, you have to collaborate, you have to be creative, you have to innovate. Where before, when we built an economy based on production and routine tasks, I don't necessarily know if social capital, I mean, there's some incidences I talk about in the book with the telegraphs. Sure where they were able to social capital did help them expedite and accelerate their performance. But I don't necessarily know if it was as important, you know? And so we're at this. No, if you're, if you're on an assembly line, yeah, picture this. If you're on an yeah. assembly line, this is for listeners, okay. not for you, obviously, but if you're on an assembly line and your tasks are very prescribed, social capital, you could say, doesn't matter a whole great deal, right? You show right. up and you know, you're being evaluated using a piecework scheme. And it's a number of these things that you get through correctly in a day. Say you're, you know, you're putting, Pretty good, and, and that's probably true in Amazon warehouses today, right? Social capital eh, matters less. But if you're in a knowledge firm where you've got to collaborate, not only in your team but cross teams and between teams and through teams and across functions and across geographies and everything like that, then it matters a, a great a great deal. Social capital begins to matter. Right? Like it's not just like 
a nice to have anymore. It's like critical. It's critical. It will differentiate. It will change the game. You know, and yeah, I don't know 100%. how farms will continue 100%. to exist with, especially in ways where you have continued to have tightened labor markets. Talent will go to where they where they can go exhibit social capital and exist in healthy relationships um, and yeah. be fulfilled. So it's going to hundred percent. Yeah. Hundred percent, hundred percent, and especially today when we have like full employment. Of course, you know p- people. Right. I mean, it's even a stronger case for doing these things well today because of, you know the knowledge workers today have a lot of choices, right? Yes, um, uh, it's not so much true if you're at the bottom of the food chain, but yeah, we do have a lot of choices these days. We should, we should, we should write, we should write a, we should co-write a hundred twenty-page version of your book. Yes, can we? It needs to be practical. That's what the next step of this is. You know what? I had to get this out of my head and, and just try to get my head around you. what does behavioral science mean for management? Because surprisingly, those intersections aren't <laughs> aren't colliding as fast as I want them, or, or actually, that business needs them to be. And I'm, so, try, I'm, try, I, I'm trying to do it. It's not easy, right? Yes, I mean, it's not easy. I mean, I, I talk about logic. I think the other very exciting area of behavioral science is, is things like habit change. So, I mean, sure. uh, one, one of my things is you know, why do people resist change? Well, the old, what I learned back in the day is it was an emotional reaction. There were fear and anxiety, there was anger, there was emotion, blah, 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 blah. and that was a view of human beings that either they needed, it was either like they thought it was a bad idea, like cognitively and rationally, or they were in some way or another triggered emotionally. Of course, resistance is much more complex than that. But one of the <laughs> reasons people resist change is is habit. Habits. And, and that's just completely ignored in the literature on organization, like, I mean, maybe less so now, maybe I've begun to make a dent in that, but culture change, culture is a collection of habits yes. and workplaces are a collection of habits. If you look at it that yes. way, and we know yes. each, each of us, our, our intuitions know it's freaking difficult to change a habit. It's difficult if you don't meditate to start to meditate, no matter how good an idea you think it is. If you don't go to the gym or you don't exercise, it's bloody difficult to get off the couch and do so. And yes. similarly, you know, God, you, know, you smoke or you do whatever, or you have some other habits that aren't so workable or something like that. Cheesecake, smoking, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's very, it's very bourbon. hard to get rid of. What, what's yours, bourbon? <laughs> bourbon. <laughs> did you go to, did you go to, you didn't go to uh, business school in Kentucky or something. Did you? <laughs> I <don't>, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know what it is. I just really, any other drink does not appeal to me, but there's something just about a nice old fashioned or bourbon and ice that I'm okay with. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Um, uh, where do you live now, by the way? Are you in Ohio? Is that right? No, I'm in Philadelphia. Oh, I see. That's a great city. Brotherly love. It's brotherly love. You know what? It's a lot cheaper than New York and DC, and I'm easily accessible to both cities. So it's um, it's a very livable city and great access. So I love it. So you, so you work from you work from home a lot. Is that right? And then work from the home or the road? Yeah. So I'm either at home yeah. or I've been doing a lot more travel. So the next last actually starts the start of this year. I've delayed a little bit of travel, but usually every week I'm I'm somewhere else, just working with clients or at a conference. So are you actually a billable consultant then these days? I thought you were in the sort of the the think tank in the middle of. Deloitte. I am tell still. Us, a tell think- us a little about. Tell us a little about. You can. This is your time to pitch Deloitte. So what are okay. you doing for Deloitte, and why is Deloitte doing good shit in this space? Yeah. So um, <laughs> no. So I am still in it, what we like to call an enabling area. So I am not billable, but what my team is now doing, which I, I think is is hopefully val- uh, valuable, is the billable consultants are now able to call us and bring us to client sites to help mm. share expertise, stories, yeah. research, and Behavioral actually get a stuff. chance the to that, share. The stuff that people are gaga for right now. Exactly. Behavioral so, yes. Yeah. So, we get to come in. I mean, it's, you know what? I'll tell you what. I can't believe this job exists some days. So we get to come in. Most of the time, I'm researching, writing, trying to figure out what what, what the hell's going on <laughs> in the future of work. And then, uh, you know, once we get an opportunity to go out and actually stress test these ideas, figure out, okay, what is it that you're actually facing with today? Where are we still sitting in the white ivory tower you know, help connect that research to reality. And, and I just think there's, I really feel like I serve as a translator half the time to um, what we're seeing in the research and what academics are saying, and then what's actually happening in, in practice. And so it's it's a great area to live between. You know, you should have your publisher send a copy of your book to the people who are CBOs right now. I can give you a list of, this is, really? is changing all the time. But yeah, why don't okay. you tell your publisher, send it. Well, one of them, yeah, is, I'll tell them. One of them is Walmart. I'm, I'm going to give you a list. Uh, right okay. Now. Where is it? Oh, I would take, yeah, that would be where's, wonderful because, yeah, where, I need to where's my list of engage CBOs? in the publisher. Oh, uh, yeah, they're useless. But, but if you, <laughs> if you, if you give them a kick, sometimes they'll do the right thing for you. This is my, this is my part of my chapter called Do You Need a Nudge Unit or a CBO? Yeah. Uh, oh, there I like are, that. There, there are CBOs at uh, Google, Walmart, Morningstar, which is a, 
investment research. Financial firm. company or food company? Yeah, yeah financial, financial. Merits, yeah. which is an ad agency, so no surprises there. And AIG, which is an insurance company. So those yeah. are the ones, uh, and that and that was, I don't know, that's not exhaustive, actually. Um, I read an article, I think it was in Fortune, that said 20 of the Fortune 500 have someone at C-suite advising them. And the rest of them okay. are, and the rest of them are gaga. Oh no! I mean, you and I, if we decided we wanted to be a CBO, I mean, we both have practical business experience, the academic side thing, and we've also been wandering around the world. I know you have, and I know I have, you know, yeah. sort of looking for case studies and use cases yes. and all of, all of that kind of stuff. So, like, we're extremely marketable right now. Except I'm 30 years older than you, so <laughs> so maybe I'm not so marketable <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I don't know though, because you've got the experience, which is great, and you know, it's like what a great time to. You know, I, I don't want to be peaking too early, you know, <laughs> got to make yeah. sure to create something that's sustainable. You know, when I read your book, I was like, this girl does not have children. There's just no way she could have, <laughs> she could have written this book and had young, <laughs> young children uh, at the same time. It's just like, this, I, is, too, this is too much work. It, it's too much work. And I just got in this, I told you, 12 months. I, I mean, I... Barely ate, you know, drank right. and breathed behavioral science you. and just I'm, immersed myself you. to the point of becoming a mad scientist. <laughs> yeah, time, I, so. I mean, the problem with your yeah. cent- center of excellence, because what you are is your behavioral center of excellence or future of work center yep. of excellence. The problem is, is having consultants knowing what they don't know. And right now, the level of awareness, you know, unless you read McKinsey Quarterly or the Harvard Business Review, which, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know how many people actually read that stuff. By the way, McKinsey is, for my money, so far ahead of any other business publication, McKinsey Quarterly, McKinsey Insights, in my opinion, in terms of being leading edge. Because I mean, when I'm writing about this stuff and I think, well, I'm at the leading edge, I'm the first person to write about this stuff. McKinsey was already sort of there like the week before. It's really annoying. They're connected into a pretty big ecosystem, I've noticed. They're, they're of, extraordinarily um, good. And they're, and they're yes, smart, smart, they're smart. Academics. They're really smart people. I mean, you know, I mean, we all like to diss McKinsey because I was, I was a consultant, right? So we like to diss McKinsey. Right. It's like the, they write the report and then they you know, charge $20 million and then they go off to another firm and write another report. And, yeah. and you know, I'd say, and you know, they leave the client and say, good luck with that. But uh, that's, that's not paradigmatic. I think their organization practice is, I suspect it's among the best in the world. I mean, I, I, I don't know this for a fact, but they're, they're just, they're just very clever. I, I applied for a job. There. <laughs> I applied for a job yeah. there like 30 years ago. I can't remember. Anyway, um, McKinsey quarterly is always, I think on the leading edge of, of, of stuff. Um, I hate, I hate them. <laughs> they're fun they're like the patriots they're fun to hate you know <laughs> now do you have a do you have a, a a dog in the hunt for the super bowl no actually this is you know what this is how i should have opened up with my unusual fact i am a diehard buffalo bills fan so I'm of course Rochester, you are you're from north of course north i north am north. of course right. i am so and how's that how's that working it, out for, how's that working out for you, you you know, I grew up, I was growing up in the 90s, four Super Bowls each time. We're like, this is going to be our time. And, you know, here I am, yeah. mid 30, still still waiting, still repping my uh, old school, you know, Jim Kelly jersey, showing up to these Bills bars we've got in Philadelphia, waiting, waiting for it to happen. So I am, I don't necessarily have a big dog in this one. I, either team, I, I think, would be fine to win, except, you know what? I, I am over the Patriots, so yeah. I would yeah. prefer. I'd prefer to see someone else win. So having the Rams win would be great. I, I'm, you, the, I can only name one person in professional NFL football, uh, and that's uh, the quarterback's name. Tom Brady. Is, who's Tom escaping, Brady. Escaping. His, you know, his <laughs> actually name was the escaping me. So having said that, yeah, no, I so don't know. I know, I know, I could probably name 50 chess players, and I know the name of one, one NFL <laughs> that's player. That's awesome. <laughs> it is weird. I'm the strangest guy. I probably named h- hundreds of hundreds of poker players. I, I, I play poker in the World Series of Poker. I'm, I'm I a, saw that because uh, it was uh, one of your former podcasts. I'm yes, a, yeah. I'm a, I, I'm a competitive poker player. Uh, did you listen to the one with Annie Duke, who's a poker professional, but now she's a cognitive scientist? No, I listened to the one who was a younger gentleman that you had met 10 years ago playing poker. Oh, Dan Blum. Oh, yeah. yeah he, he was doing he, the travels. Um, yeah, the event, he, he spent nine months in, in Latin America. Yeah, he spent on nine the bus. Months. Yes, on a bus, yes. on a school bus, on a yellow school bus. Yes. Uh, yep, I, so I that was the one. He's an extraordinary guy. No, I have one with Annie Duke, who was. Uh, oh, she, listen, uh, listen she, that had, one next. she has a bracelet. Well, hers is called um, "Thinking in Bets." Uh, life is more like poker oh. than like chess. So it's actually she's a she's actually I think finishing her PhD in cognitive science. She she was 
started her PhD in cognitive science. She's about my age, mid fifties, let's say. Okay. And uh, she uh, started her PhD in cognitive science, and then she moved to Montana because she fell in love with some dude. Uh, and she's living in Montana, and she's no longer able to. And then she has some puppies. So she has children, and so like, what am I going to do to earn her money? So she she started playing poker, and her brother's a very famous poker player as well. Oh uh, my gosh, that's amazing. Howard Letter. And she, no, she 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 you know, ten years ago it was one of the best ten of the game. She doesn't do that anymore though. She's she's in very high demand because. Um, the big thing right now, this isn't in the behavioral science canon, although it's not so million, many miles away, is decision-making under uncertainty. So in a world mm -hmm. where if you're a physicist, you know that the world isn't deterministic. It, it exists in probability functions, but you don't know that if you're, uh, we think of things like an ROI for a project, you'll see, I would say, if someone said, uh, I want to, you know, if you're pitching to a V, well, they know this, but if you're pitching a project internally and you say, 25% uh, of the time we'll um, make a profit, 55% of the time we'll at best break even, and 20% uh, of the time we'll lose our shirts, you know, good luck. But in fact, that's what happens, right? That's what right. happens in change. That's what happens in investment. That kind of yes. what happens in life, you know. I mean, li yep. life is, you know, you could look at it as a series of a series of calculated gambles. And so she talks a lot about decision making under certainty. In fact, we were talking about NFL in a minute ago. I don't know who this dude was, but there was a dude who went for it on fourth down or something like that. It was like in a Super okay. Bowl or something like that. Do you know this story? It's in the very first page of a book, and he made okay. the probabilistic right play. He like went for it in fourth down. He was like fourth okay. and two on the on the in fourth and goal. And, you know, it was late in the game or something like that. And yeah. he went for it and he threw an interception or they stopped oh, him geez. and he lost the game. Right. And then oh, everyone geez. said, it this sounds is like something the Buffalo Bills would do. <laughs> right. <laughs> and everybody said, like, this is the stupidest decision that's ever been made in, in football history. And actually, afterwards, in the cold light of day, it was actually the highest probability of success. Wow. But the the yep. way we think of life is that if I do this and it works out, I made the right decision. That's not right. Is not right. <laughs> you know, so much more you can complex. make a really, you can make a really stupid decision, and luck out. Uh, I, I've done many times in my life, and, and you can make a really good decision, and and the world turns out, turns out badly for you, uh, yep. and and that's just the way the way the world works. And so Annie's book, Annie Duke's book, uh, I do have a podcast on this. is called Thinking in Bets, and it's a great book. Okay. And, and she's a huge demand at board level and sea level right now. For that reason, because they want to know, this is an uncertain world, this is a volatile world, this is a probabilistic yes. world. So how do we make decisions in a world where there's that much probabilistic uncertainty? So it's really, I think she's she's great. She's also, you know, oh, a, great, sounds wonderful. a great human being. Yeah, she's she's awesome. Uh, and she lives okay. in Philadelphia, actually. She lives in a place that's oh, got a, a, a Welsh name. What's the name of, oh, there's a, like a Welsh town near Philadelphia. It's got a Welsh name. I think it's probably Super Turning. Posh. Po super Posh. Oh, I mean, super Posh. I'm like... So uh, coming from like I feel like there's so many towns like I would I would call it Philadelphia and you know I live in Conshohocken there's the main line it's Melvern there's Germantown oh Balakinwood oh Balakinwood yeah yeah oh, yeah. yeah that's Very a Welsh that's, 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 yes. the, that's a Welsh word yeah um, okay yeah anyway oh, so is, that's where she lives made a so, so no actually actually you guys should hook up she's awesome she really yes. is awesome okay um, I'm gonna she lives about 15 20 minutes away that's perfect it's in the Welsh tract of Pennsylvania sent in the 1680s by Quakers it was two separate towns Bala and Kunwood there you go um anyway yeah you should yes. check out you should check out any because anyway we should okay. wrap we should wrap this up you know I'm in awe of what you've been able to achieve with your book it's it's uh oh, Paul, thank you you know anything I can do for you to you know, help you publicize it. I'll obviously put a link to the book in the in the show notes. Um, I'll put a link to many of the references you talk about. Is there a link, a Deloitte yep. link that we should put in the show notes? A link to your to your practice, to your organization practice, or to your yeah, center of excellence? You know what? There, I've got um, an author page, so I will send that over to you. And so that way, if any of the the listeners want to just learn more about any of these behavioral, we've gone deep on the role of scarcity and how that influences your decision making. Oh, good. You know, how do you humanize change? So we, we, we've gone a little, I've gone a little bit deeper on some of these behavioral topics. So I'll just send you a link to that after this. Um, just, you can put up there as well. I, 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 I need a picture. Uh, I need a picture okay. of you that, that you can send me that smiley, sure. smiley picture from your, yeah. Skype, your Skype profile <laughs> yeah. or something like that. <laughs> uh, no, I'll, yep. a, I'll, I'll probably do a composite of you in the book. So to add a human, okay. fa uh, That'd be add wonderful. A hu human face uh, to the book. So uh, let me let me uh, just uh, I want to say Kelly's book is how behavioral economics influences management decision making. It's a it's a long read, but uh, if you're interested in this subject, it's certainly a great a great a great resource.
Hi, I'm trying to keep the show under an hour, so I just want to share a couple of business books I'm reading. You know I probably don't like much, think much of most business books, but I'd like to shout out Isabel de Klerk, who's I think from Holland's book on social technologies and organizations, which is in English, and Steve Denning's book, The Age of Agile, both of which I've read as research for the book I'm writing, Impact, Using Science to Change Behaviors, Hearts and Minds, which coming soon to find bookstores near you. And I want to give a shout out to Kelly's book, How Behavioral Economics Influences Management Decision Making. In terms of pop culture at the moment, I'm actually re-watching Breaking Bad. And the last episode of season one of Breaking Bad is perhaps the best single episode of television that I've ever, ever seen. I'm still thinking about it 72 hours later. The second time I watched it, it was, you know, it was amazing the first time. And I'm speechless the second time at how clever that episode was. I hear Netflix has canceled Jessica Jones, so I now hate Netflix officially, but I did enjoy their show called Happy about an alky cop pursued and aided by little blue flying unicorn. Yes, it's very improbable, very crazy, a sort of black mirror kind of crazy. The unicorn's called Happy, who's the imaginative friend of a daughter that's of a girl that's been kidnapped and is in some peril. Very good show. Very funny. Very dark. But that's all for now. Anyway, I look forward to talking to you next week. And thanks a lot for listening to Think Bigger, Think Better and for your support. To celebrate the launch of the show, and thank you all for listening, I'm going to be giving away books. Lots and lots of books. All you have to do is leave a review in iTunes. We're going to raffle off a book every single week for 12 weeks. So head on over to paulgibbons.net slash iTunes to get easy-to-follow directions and let me know the title of your review to make sure that you're entered to win. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Think Bigger, Think Better. Great ideas are great, but this isn't gospel. Share your critical thinking in the comments. Where do I disagree? What insights were most powerful? If you got value, don't forget to share the value by sharing the podcast. Finally, to get information on book and blog releases and new video content, head over to paulgibbons.net and join the community of thinkers talking about using science and philosophy to make our world a better place.